here's my position on water vapor condensation of water vapor because of the dipole moment two molecules of water uh, are attracted to each other the negative end to the positive end of the other and the, and the thing that keeps them apart is a uh, molecular motion heat all in, all that is required for water to condense is dissipation of heat loss of heat when two nearby water molecules uh, are able to link up this way they condense automatically there's no need for cloud condensation nuclei although cloud condensation nuclei might speed up the process for example if there is not enough uh, if there's too much heat in the system and the two molecules I just mentioned cannot quite join up electrically um, the presence of something upon which they can condense might trigger condensation prematurely so to speak why is there a correlation between GCR and TSI and clouds NASA admits that we are inside the local cloud NASA admits that our solar system is in motion toward some particular point in the galaxy our entire solar system is moving somewhere it's not just the galaxy spinning and all the stars spinning in unison uh, I suspect but don't have the proof that stars move around much like moths under a street light but in slow motion suppose you filmed moths under a street light little bugs buzzing around attracted to the light confused they're just buzzing around a swarm but they, what if you recorded it on videotape and um, slowed it way way down so they appear to be motionless they're moving like the hour hand of a clock the hour hand of a clock so slow you didn't notice it at first well uh, the stars are moving very fast but they're so far apart so incredibly far apart that from our perspective uh, they appear to be frozen motionless unmoving because we're watching them at, at such a distance assume that we are inside the local cloud and we are in motion what might we encounter as we move through interstellar space clouds of interstellar material which uh, consists of among other things hydrogen the hydrogen cannot get into the Sun and feel the sun and brighten the sun at all none whatsoever oh really because the sun produces an electromagnetic field oh really the earth produces an electromagnetic field and do things get in do things penetrate the earth's atmosphere and reach the surface absolutely an electromagnetic field does not repel matter it alters the course of some charged particles and the charged particles also get in but they have to get in through a passageway namely near the poles producing the northern lights and the southern lights some cosmic radiation is repelled deflected so that there's less of it on the surface of the earth and there is out in space uh, uh, 
but I'll consider that at some other time. But a cloud of interstellar material composed, among other things, of hydrogen, hydrogen would provide fuel for the sun if, it, if only it could get in. It would provide some small amount of fuel. Now, a small amount is actually not exactly a small amount because the sun is the most massive object in the solar system. 99% of the mass of the solar system is the sun. It has a strong gravitational field. And even though this interstellar material is tenuous, dispersed, uh, you suck up enough of it long enough, it'll have a slight effect on the sun. The sun can get a hold of enough of this stuff long enough, it would have a slight effect on the brightness of the sun and the longevity of the sun. Resupplying it with fuel, refueling it, perpetuating it, lengthening its lifespan. So as we move through space and we encounter a cloud of hydrogen gas, uh, the only problem is it can't possibly get through. It can't possibly reach the sun. It cannot possibly refill the sun because of an electromagnetic magnetic field. I'll have you know that this electromagnetic field, this bubble, this heliosphere uh, is practically debunked. Uh, the IBEX mission failed to detect uh, any bow shock. And uh, even if there is a bow wave, such as you would expect uh, uh, to see, visualize around the Earth as solar wind uh, swept past and around the Earth being deflected partially by the Earth's magnetic field, some of this stuff gets in. And uh, the same way with the sun. Some of this interstellar material, I theorize, can get in. When it gets in, in theory, the sun would slightly brighten. The Earth's atmosphere would receive slightly more light which would be converted into heat, which would warm the atmosphere slightly, which would uh, cause slightly less clouds, which would allow even more light to penetrate to the Earth's surface and warm the Earth's surface. So the brightening of the sun has a, a positive feedback relationship with clouds. When the sun dims, the clouds increase and thus amplify the, the dimming effect. Now, why is cosmic radiation correlated with the sun's brightness and dimming and the, and the, and the Earth's clouds forming and then receding? This cloud of gas would moderate cosmic radiation. This cloud of hydrogen gas and dust would moderate, disperse, and diffuse cosmic radiation so less of it would strike the earth. At the very same time, it is also refueling the sun, causing the sun to brighten, causing the clouds to diminish. There, there is a correlation, but it's coincidental. It's not causative. So, in short, what I'm proposing is that uh, there's no relationship between cosmic radiation and Earth climate. No direct relationship. The main thing is the presence, or I should say, our presence inside of this cloud of gas, which is probably clumpy, for lack of a better word, clumpy, you know, more dense in some spots, less dense in other spots. And then, after passing through this cloud, uh, we would encounter a void, an absence of hydrogen, which could uh, cause a prolonged glacial episode on the Earth. I managed to say that in less than 10 minutes.